Hi, everybody. So we're in our last session. Woo! Um, we were talking a little bit before class, and uh, an idea came up that I just wanted to see if it actually is, is going to, to work. Um, let me just try something here. So I'm going to say class A, and we'll create a fun A. Actually, make him infix foo with another A. And let's just see if I can do a fun C. And we'll say val A equals A. And we'll make a B. So the issue was if I said A foo B, that works just fine. But if I hit enter there, it, it screws up because it can't parse it. It's not ambiguous anymore. But can I put that in parentheses? Yes! Yes! Okay, that'll, that, that'll help on a couple things. It's kind of ugly. It, it's, it's really nice if you have a long chain of these things. So if you're using the infixes as a builder, um, this can actually be really readable. Um, but the prints on the outside, it's like, eh, eh, I don't know. Um, but I, I was just interested in finding out if the parens would make it unambiguous, and it did. So good. Okay, nice to know. Important safety tip. Thanks, Egon. Um, okay, so somebody got the reference. Yes. <laughs> okay, so any questions before we start up? What is this? Why is that all? Oh, because the font size was pumped up. Oof. Okay, <coughs> so um, today I'm going to cover some stuff that I wanted to cover earlier, but then I had that sick time, and then trying to fit things in just didn't quite work out so well. Plus some stuff that I would have liked to cover earlier, but at the same time wouldn't make sense until later in the course anyway. So I, I'm trying to juggle figuring out where this is going to fit in. But basically I want to talk about data representations. And unfortunately... My Surface Book is misbehaving right now, and I cannot get it to detach. Oh, here we go. Yes. Okay, maybe now. Um, it probably that was probably it. It was probably just needed to charge. So I'll let that start up, and see if I can get things to hook up. Okay, here. This is on staff. This will be a lot nicer to draw pictures. I can pop him around. See if I can get this connected. There we go. And I'm going to be a little tethered to this guy because I'm going to need power because he doesn't have a charge. So anyway, hopefully this is going to work. And we'll create a new page. Pop him up there. I don't want that. And let's talk about data representations. So let's think about different ways that we can represent our data. I mean, in the olden days, what was probably the only type of representation we had for data in the very, very olden days? Files. Go back farther. Cards. Not quite that far. <laughs> Well, what does a punch card represent? Ones and zeros. Ones and zeros, which is? Binary. binary. So binary representations are probably the, the earliest, simplest ways. Simplest is, is a matter of, you know, <laughs> questionable. Um, but putting stuff into binary, you can do that, right? We can store data as binary. The problem is we have to have a binary representation for things to put them in there. Now, if all we're throwing down there are numbers, great. Not a problem, until you start thinking about the size of the numbers. It's like, are these ints? Are they bytes? Are they longs? Are they doubles? Are they what? You know, what is the format of those numbers? So we have to have some way of indicating what's in there. And there's really two ways we can approach that. How do you think we can approach figuring out what is actually in that file? So when I look at the next number, if I want to know what it is, there's really two ways we can do that. So we could define some kind of format. So basically, there's some kind of an indicator to tell us what that is. 
So that's that's one approach. Is something in there? Well, actually, uh, let me take what you said in two from two different angles because that actually covers both of the angles that I was thinking about here. One is an indicator. So in the file itself, we have some kind of marker to say what's the next thing. So maybe we have an indicator byte, and in there, if you have a zero, then it's a the next thing is just a byte by itself. If you have a one, the next thing is an int, or well, maybe a short. And then two, maybe it's an int, three, maybe it's a long, and so on. And so you can have just some kind of a byte that just indicates what the next thing is to read. And then your code can say, based on that, I'm going to read that much data from the file. Makes sense, right? That's one approach. And this is basically baking some information into the file. The other approach, and again, when you say come up with a format, is to have the code knows what the next thing is going to be. So the code could say, I know I'm always going to write a byte and then a double, then an int, and then a string. Or maybe a byte, double, int, length of string, followed by the string itself. Uh, so the code would have that knowledge baked in as opposed to the file having that information stored. Now think about the differences between these two and advantages or disadvantages. What type of disadvantages might we have on that uh, second approach? So you have to change your code every time you decide you want to change how you exchange the data. Um, if all we had were indicators to say what type of data is next, we still have to do that. Which that leads to later on when we start talking about keyword-based information, where in the file itself, the file says, this is for this piece of data, and here's the format of it. As opposed to just the next thing is a byte, the next thing is an int. But think about... I guess it's a problem for either one of these. <laughs> what happens if you want to add new data to the file? So you have to change your code, right? New data to the end or new, like, data types? Ah, so here comes some questions. New data to the end, new data types. Now we got some big code changes, right? Think about this code sitting on the disk, and you run it against different versions of your application. What happens or can happen? They're not necessarily compatible, right? One version of your code wrote this thing out, and he obviously can read it, assuming that he had his read and his write function set up properly. He should be able to say, okay, I've written out an int, a byte, and a string. Now I'm going to read an int, a byte, and a string in that order. So the order is very dependent. If we have a new version that prints out, writes out more information or changes the order information or changes the types of information, now we're in real big trouble. So versioning is a real big problem here. And versioning in general with data files is an issue that you have to really think careful about. How to set things up so that they'll be forward compatible, you know, or potentially backward compatible, so that if you have a newer version, write it out, an older version can still read it. So ideally, you want both directions to be able to read it. Generally, if all you're doing is adding things, there's easy ways to make it backward compatible. Basically just have the backward compatible version just ignore stuff. But when we're talking this kind of a format here where we're just putting in the data and we're not trying to put in any information about which fields are which, this is very brittle over time. Especially if this file is used for some kind of persistence over time. If this is just used as a data format to, tra to transfer data from two active running instances of the same thing, it's not a big deal assuming it's the same instance running, right? Like if you're doing it for RPC, that's okay. And by the way, in uh, Android, the parsable implement uh, interface basically is meant to do this where you're just writing out the raw data so that the other end of an RPC call can pick it up. Parsable is not meant for long-term persistence. That's where serialization in Java comes in. <coughs> um, but Basically, what we're just doing is saying, write this, write this, write this, write this. Read this, read this, read this, read this. Boom. Okay. So this approach, generally safest for remote procedure calls or you know any other type of, of transferring information between two running processes. Make sense so far? Okay. And it's fairly easy to do. And if we take a look at a... Oops. 
raw binary file here. So this one, I have some data at the top here, this x42, this name to a string, and then this list of strings. And I want to write that out to a binary file so I can read it back in. Again, assuming that I'm not worried about versioning. You know, if I add something in, I'm going to want to put some extra information into the file or pick a different format. So if I decided to make this forward compatible, I'd probably want to put a version number in there so I could know which version generated this file. So to write this guy, I start off, I'm going to create a data output stream, which is a nice little way in Java to just break stuff down into bytes. File output stream, are you guys familiar with file output stream versus file writer? The difference between the two? So file output stream is binary. You're just going to write bytes to it versus a file writer is a character based. So the character based one is going to, by default, assume the default uh, text encoding on your platform, but you can also specify different text encodings. Um, I think that's right. Or is UTF the default? I'm pretty sure that the, the platform specific default is the default for it. <coughs> so, and you can also transfer between a file output stream and a reader sorry, a writer, by wrapping the file output stream in an output stream writer, which does the character translation for you. So what I'm doing here is I'm wrapping in a data output stream, which gives me some little functions like write int, write utf, and write int. <laughs> I said write int twice. How about that? Um, so inside here, this use statement, or the, this use block in Kotlin is exactly the same type of thing as a try with resources. And what that'll do is close that file automatically once this block is completed. So inside here, I'm going to take data output stream as my parameter there, write out the X, write out the name, write out the size of my list, and then write out each of the items in the list. So this is a fairly standard way of writing a binary file. The read does the exact same order for the reads. The order is really critical here, similar for parcelables in Android if you get working on Android. Hello. So we have our data input stream which we're going to read that X, read that name, read the number of entries, and then for each entry, we're going to create an array list and then add the items by reading those items there. So this is a very common way to write a binary file and read a binary file. Make some sense? Now, unfortunately, I can't seem to find a way to look at binary files in IntelliJ. Um, so there, it's like I tried when I ran this thing. I didn't see one. There might be one somewhere, but there might be a plug-in, but I, I didn't didn't have a chance to look for that. So there, I, I read it and I wrote it. I wrote it and then read it again. Um, and his format is down here. Maybe it's here and I just didn't see it. I can open it in the spell checker. That'll work real well. Let's go ahead and just take a quick peek for a plug-in. I didn't think about looking at that before. Hex. Hex view. Why not? Let's do the hex view. Robo hexar. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> you screwed me over if that's the case. We'll see if it, I mean, chan now if that were an Eclipse plugin, chances are pretty good it would break. <laughs> even, like, did IntelliJ exist 11 years ago? I think so. Well. That's a long ass time. <laughs> I mean, that's just before I started it. Uh, that's just before I started at APL. It might have, maybe that was, maybe that's like the first plugin. It could be it could be the very first plugin. Oh, it's probably just a view though, so um hmm. I actually want an editor. Let's try one more time real quick and then I'll punt on that and say we'll just assume it's working okay. So let's say hex. Delta hex editor. From twenty eighteen. <laughs> yeah. A little more promising there, except it's a broken image here, so therefore it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be totally evil. Restart. Let's try that one more time.
Oh, on the little the little pop up thing at the beginning. Yeah, this little it's IntelliJ. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I like nicely laid out things. I'm not great at designing them. That's why we have graphic artists. Um, okay, let's try this one more one last time here. There's no hex. Really? Maybe it says binary. Huh. I mean, that's, that's going to take me back to this again. Okay, well, I'm going to punt on that. We'll just assume that it looks okay. Um, I might be able to open it up outside. What's that? You know, actually, I could do that. It, Sublime Text does. Here we go. <laughs> That's not helpful at all. Or I could just find it. And shoot, what was what was the thing that I was doing? Can I? <laughs> it's a comedy of errors here. Why is formats not, where is, where is this? Why is that underneath? Oh, I accidentally created this project underneath a student's thing. That's wonderful. Wow. So. Desktop, uh, DSL class, HW2. There it is. <laughs> I don't know how I manage that. <laughs> um, thank you. There, yes! <laughs> Woo! Wow, that was a lot harder than it should have been, huh? Okay, so... Here we can see that we've written data. Isn't that exciting? Wow. Ooh, I'm so glad I did that. Um, so like, for example, this 2A, that's a 42. So that's the age that we wrote out inside the file. Um, this, uh, well, actually, this whole thing here, that, that's, that's the 42 there. Um, so binary representation. All that to show a damn binary file. Anyway, so. Um, Disadvantages in this approach, and a similar disadvantage if you wrote out textual things in a specific order like that, is that it's brittle for versioning, right? Okay. What's another disadvantage of this? As I just aptly demonstrated. You can't read. It's not human readable. It's, and it's, it's even harder to write because you have to find an editor. Uh, so it's, it's not something that you really can see what's in there very easily. You need code to look at what the data is or just happen to read binary really well. Um, and then you, uh, uh, you can't edit it very well. Now, a long time ago when I played Wizardry on an Apple, Apple II Plus, um, I don't know why I did it, but I decided to go in using a hex editor and change the names of the monsters in the actual files on the disks. So I had like the big, big bad guy was Darth Vader because this came out like just around the time Star Wars came out. And uh, so it's like, you know, I had all the bad guys were like different Star Wars creatures. It was kind of kind of geeky. <coughs> Actually, at that point, it was nerdy because I was a nerd back then. Um, I'm a geek now. So data representations for binary. Good okay so far? Let's take a look at some other approaches here. We can... Boom. Come over here, create a new page. Um, we can put... Uh, text into a file instead of binary. But we need to have some way to figure out where to read things. One of the things with the binary representation is that we can have an indicator that says how long the rest of the stuff is we need to read. With text, if we're just having a block of text, we need to somehow break it up into pieces. So the first thing we look at here are delimited text files. This means we have some kind of a character that explicitly breaks up different things in the file. This can be useful in a couple ways. If all the data is the same type, it's just a list of stuff, then it's pretty resilient over time because we're just saying read the next, read the next, read the next, read the next, right? 
if there's different types of data or different pieces of data, then we have the same kind of versioning issue. Okay. So in this case, I might write out 42 vertical bar, Scott vertical bar, 10 items in the list, and then A, B, C, D, and so on. Make sense? And that just gives me a way to read the text in and then parse it out pretty simply without having to create a whole antler parser or something like that. Okay, what kind of disadvantages do I have on this? We already have the versioning issue, right? What else can be an issue here? Could be large on disk. So for storing it, it, it uh, is very likely going to be larger than the binary. Very, very likely. What if the data has vertical bars? Then we have to come up with some sort of escape sequence, which we know how much fun those are. I mean, that's the whole reason we have all those escapes and strings. It's just a pain in the butt, right? <coughs> that's one of the bigger issues in this format. But we've actually moved into a realm here now where the user can read this and the user can write it if they're very careful. You have to be a lot more careful in this type of a format than a name value pair type format, right? Because you have to know which positions mean which things. But for the most part, if you saw this record and said, I need to change a user's name, chances are pretty good you'd know which field to do there. If you say I have to change the user's age, then you start having this, well, is it the 42 or is it the 10? if you don't have any documentation. And then that can be a little dangerous because if I change this one accidentally, I'm completely throwing off whatever's on the rest of that line because I'm assuming a certain number of things there. Okay, let's see a little example of this. So in this one, what I'm going to do I have my data defined already, so I'm just going to write that data out and then read it back in. <coughs> Excuse me. For my write, I'm just going to use a print writer. And I'm going to say print, 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 print to print stuff out there. So I'm going to open up whatever that file name is. I'm going to print x to string, vertical bar, name, vertical bar, the number of items in the list, vertical bar, and then each of the items in the list followed by a vertical bar. Hello. I haven't seen them. Uh, okay, so, um, and in this case, I'm going to have that trailing vertical bar. Eh, it's an extra character. I could strip it off if I really wanted to, or I could have some smarts in here and just keep track of. If it's the last one, then don't. I didn't want to bother. I was in a hurry to create a quick example. For reading it, a little trickier, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to read the whole thing in one shot into a string. And in Kotlin, there's this read text. So if, if you've used... Um, uh, the commons I.O. function from Apache, the commons I.O. package, they have a read into string. You can read a file into a string completely. Don't ever do this unless you really know your data is small. I mean, if you have big data, you can blow data out pretty quickly with this type of thing, <coughs> especially if you're running in a 32-bit VM. Um, so what this is going to do is open up that file, read the text into contents, and then I'm just going to use the normal string split function here this is actually a, a uh, override in Kotlin that does a couple extra little fancy things with it, but I'm just using it the same way I'd use the, the Java one. Just breaking them up based on that vertical bar. Note that I'm not taking any type of escape into account here. So if my data has vertical bars, I am so screwed. Okay, But again, just a simple example is all I intend here. I'm going to grab X from the first chunk in that it returns an array. Name is from the second chunk. The number of entries is the third chunk create my list based on that number of entries, start off the thing that I want to look at in the chunks as number three, and then for each of those entries, I'm going to grab chunks n++. Okay, make some sense. Okay, so um, actually what I could have done here is instead of using zero until num entries for each and having this separate counter here, I could have said for each indexed, n comma string and then in here said n plus three that's a little nicer 
oops, but a, oh, I don't need an S, do I? That's just for each, because the number, duh. Okay, so there we go. So we're going to add that into the list there. <coughs> Any questions on that? And if I run this, boom, everything comes out okay. Let's take a look at what the file looks like. And there we go. So that's exactly what we expected this file to look like, just writing that data out, read it back in. Okay, not terribly thrilling, but sometimes this is useful. <coughs> what do you think the, the big driving factor is going to be between using something like this versus something like a full-on DSL, external DSL? What do you think the main consideration would be there? Data complexity, exactly. It's like if your data is fairly simple, like if this is pretty much all we had, this could be just fine. Or if maybe you're just storing three things, this would be great. A full-on DSL would be a lot of overkill for that. Um, if you don't want to have somebody be able to hand edit, this might be perfectly fine as well. And I would prefer this over the binary format simply because I could pop the text up and look at it really quickly. Again, assuming it's fairly small, so I don't have storage considerations there. Um, but having some way to be able to just quickly take a peek at it, that can be really useful for debugging, especially if you're on site. Okay, questions on that? <coughs> Excuse me. I do have the recording going, don't I? Yeah, that would suck. Okay, so let's come back over to here. We can also have a slightly different form of text delimiting. just using new lines. And that's a nice way to write a W, isn't it? Uh, having new lines instead of a delimiter can make the parsing a little simpler. Okay. And on top of that, you have a character that you might or might not have to escape depending on what your data is. If your data is less likely to have new lines in it, or if, it's, if you don't allow new lines in your data, this is a definite, definite win there. The code on this, I just went a slightly different approach on it. Instead of doing the read everything at once, I'm just reading a line at a time. So this is something that can survive a larger file, you know, assuming you do something with the data as opposed to keeping all the data in memory. Uh, and what we're going to do here, the write ends up being very similar, except instead of putting those delimiters, I just use println each time here instead of print. So it's throwing in the new line characters as the delimiters themselves. <coughs> For the read of it, pardon me a second. OK, so uh, when we're reading it in, I'm using a buffered reader to say, give me the next line, give me the next line, give me the next line, give me the next line. Um, and um, yeah, so what I'm doing here is I'm reading the next line as an int for x, reading it as a string for the name. It, by the way, gets rid of the new line character when you call read line. It gets, throws it away. So if you actually needed the new line character, you're going to have to add it back in yourself manually. And then grab the number of entries, and each one grab the line. So I think the code here is a little bit simpler to parse it back in. Um, you're still going to have an issue if you have new lines as valid inside your data. Then you have to come up with some escape sequence. And you may just use a backslash n for your escape sequence there, and then once you've got the line, replace that character. Yes? I mean, uh, are most textual representations and stuff uh, of delimited data like combinations of those two? So the question is, aren't most delimited uh, combinations of these two? So, yeah, like a CSV file. So in a, in a CSV file, now you're adding another dimension to your data. <coughs> so you've now got lines and multiple lines. So in that case, you can read a line and then break it up by delimiters. And uh, that would have been a good thing for me to cover next. But hey, I'll take it. I didn't have to think about it. That's great. So yeah, a CSV file combines those two. Um, it depends on if your data is one-dimensional or two-dimensional. So if your data is, I guess one-dimensional is technically the right way to talk about that, because it's basically a line of data. So it's just a single list of data. Then you can choose either or. And I would tend to go toward the new line delimited. If it's two-dimensional, like your CSVs, 
then getting into, you know, each line gets parsed out by delimiters is yet another way to go. So it can, you can go basically up to two dimensions on this, unless you start adding more delimiters, right? So we could delimit, could add curly braces or parens and things like that, in which case you can break them down and have this stuff nested all over the place, which would just be loads of fun. In which case you have like JSON. Hey, Segway man, thank you. <coughs> so if we come back over here, now we're going to start getting into formatted text. And before we hit JSON, I want to talk about key value pairs. In particular, Java has a decent implementation of this called properties. And it just makes it so you basically are setting up a map and then boom, dump it. Read the map back in. And that works pretty well. So formatted text with key value pairs, now we're starting to remember which pieces of data in our file are associated with which e actual piece of data I want to have in memory. So now versioning is less of an issue. If all you're doing is additive, the new stuff will be ignored by older versions. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the newer versions, you just say if something's missing, come up with a reasonable default. And so if the only type of thing you're doing is adding new values, it's fairly easy. Renaming values, deleting values, that's when things get sticky. And so in general, I mean, this is with any type of a data problem, whether you're going to a database or data file, try to just be additive. If there's any way at all, it makes your versioning life a lot simpler. You don't have to worry about data breaking. <coughs> Otherwise, you have to start putting a bunch of conditions in there. So key value pairs take you in a nice step that way. We can do that with properties. Let's take a look at him first. So inside here, same data at the top up here. And what I'm going to do to write this is create a properties object. I'm going to put data into it just like I would in a map. So properties x is x to string. Properties name is name to string. He's already string. Num entries is that. And then for each entry, I'm creating a key that looks like list.1, list or list.0, list.1, list.2, and so on. Then I'm going to write that out just by calling properties store, passing in the writer. You also pass in this comment. It just writes a comment at the top of the file for you. When we're reading it, I'm going to say take that properties, load it from the file, and then get property. So get property, get property, get the num entries. And then when I'm reading them, I'm going to say properties, get property, list dot dollar n. So fairly easy way to get a list of things. Now this is a map. So keep in mind that the order things get written to the file is not going to necessarily look the same as the order you put them into the map. Um, if we were using some kind of a thing like a tree map behind the scenes and serialize the tree map, then the order should match up. Um, assuming that I got the right one there for tree map. No, tree map is based on the ordering value of the keys. Which one was the, or was that the one? One of them, there's a sorted map that says preserve the order in which I add them. And there's another sorted one that says based on the keys, sort them based on that value. And I can't remember which one is which. Well, skip list is a different kind of structure. No, it's, no, it, it implements sorted map. Right, and it's just that the sorting strategies are different between them, and I can never remember which one is which. I always have to look them up. So if I look up tree map, the, natu the tree map is the natural ordering of the keys. Um, there is a... Um, So maybe that's not the one that I was thinking of. There is, there is one of them. It might not implement navigable map. It might just implement map. There's a sorted map interface, too. But I think navigable map extends. I think that might be the one that I want to look at here. Uh, I'll have to poke around to find it again. But there was one, I just can't remember the name of it, and it preserved the order based on the order that you added them to the map. Linked hash map.
in which the keys are inserted. That's the one that I'm thinking of. So linked hash map preserves the order. Tree map does based on the uh, natural sorting order of the keys. So that said, if you used a linked hash map and then had a, and then you wrote that out, then you would have the same order in the file if that mattered to you. If it didn't matter, using something like properties has the built-in write support for you. So when we run this guy, same results. Isn't that exciting? And when I look at data.properties, here's what the properties file looks like. So here's the little comment at the top. It says when it was written and then has the data. And you can see the data is in just a total, I'm not going to say random order because it's going to follow an order that's in the properties file, but it has nothing to do with the order you added them in. Uh, so we'll see our X, we'll see our name, we'll see the number of entries, and then 0, 1, 2, 3 for the entries there. Unless the implementation changes. Yeah, the hash. If you change the hash codes, that could change it. Um, actually, it's the hash. It's on the. It's hashed on strings. So that shouldn't do it. But if they change the implementation from version to version, the order might change. But it doesn't matter because we're actually looking up the keys and using those values. So this is an example of how you could put uh, two-dimensional data in there because we have that list. You know, we have overall our top things and has a list. If we wanted to, we could have any number of, of depth to this array that we want to just by saying the first number dot the second number dot the third number and so on. Um, as long as you keep track of the number of entries at each level there. So part of that first object, you know, you'd have the total number of entries and then inside there you could have sub entries dot zero or sub entry count subnum entries dot zero equals the number of entries, that type of thing. So you'd need arrays of arrays and all that type of stuff. Um, but it's doable. It's editable by the user and a little bit better than that situation before. Um, but it's kind of chancy, right? The user needs to understand this file. It's not super friendly. But it's a step above what we had before, right? Okay. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was going into smarter formats like JSON or XML. I use the word smarter very reservedly with XML. I mean, XML, there's some good benefits to it. Well, just let me ask you this. What's, what's between JSON and XML? What do you think the pros and cons are between those two? What can you do in XML that you can't do in JSON? Validation. So validation based on a schema happens in XML. Now there are some types of, um, there's a couple JSON schema specs out there, but it's nothing official and nothing standardized. With XML, the validation and the schema is all standard. So you should be able to use any number of tools to do that. Um, with JSON, can't do that. And there's one other really big thing that you can do in XML that you can't do in JSON. And this is really where people get burned a lot. Links. There's no standardized way to specify a link from one JSON object to another JSON object. Okay. Um, and what that means is, because JSON is, is intended to be a strictly hierarchical, de hierarchical definition where you have a, a root and then items underneath it and then items underneath those, and they're all independent items. They're not intended to be cross-linked or reused. In XML, you can link to somebody something by using the ID of the node. So in JSON, you typically have to come up with some interesting ideas, like for what I did in, in uh, the tool that I'm using JSON to transfer stuff, is I have ID and then some ID for it and the data in him. And then when I want to reference it, here's a new object down here. Inside here, if I wanted to say my parent, I came up with a convention that's pound, pound, the ID of the other guy. And then whenever I see a pound, pound something, I end up in the data that I'm reading. I treat it as a link to that ID. So there's other formats that people have come up with. You know, pound, pound is one I've seen other people use. But there's 10, 20 different ways people have done linking on there. Some more formal than others. I wanted to go with something fairly simple. Okay. Now, 
looking at what these guys look like, what's easier for the user to manage? Generally, I'd say JSON. JSON's a lot less verbose. Um, you don't have uh, quite as many angle brackets and things like that in there, <laughs> unless you explicitly have it in your data. Um, you don't have to worry about schemas. You don't have to worry about namespaces. It's just, boom, here's the data. Where did JSON come from? What does JSON stand for? So where is it easily, easily usable? In JavaScript, it's, it's, this is one of the, the big advantages of JSON is if you have a JSON file, you can just execute it in JavaScript and boom, it creates objects for you. But don't do that. You really want to make sure you escape things because if you do that, you're gonna, it's going to be similar to squeal injection. Um, but it's something that you can do. You know, that was the whole intent for it. Um, now we just use JSON parses to do it, but it's just JavaScript code. Okay, so questions on that so far? Let's see a quick example of doing this. Um, the JSON parser that I'm using here is the json.org JSON parser, which isn't the friendliest one in the world, but I've used it a billion times in the past, and it was the quickest one for me to write up an example. Um, so inside here, I have my same data. Actually, no, I went to a little bit more complex data. I have person objects now inside here, along with X and, X and name here. So these person objects have names and ages. I think Wilford Brimley is around 99. I'm not quite sure. Um, and then uh, for writing, create a JSON object that can represent my overall set of data. He has those top globals of name and X. I'm just sticking in there as, and putting them in. I'm going to create a JSON array to represent that list of things. For each things in my real list of people, create an object to represent it put in the names and ages, put that in the array, put the array into the overall object, and then write the thing out. And I'm using an indent factor here so it pretty prints. Okay. To read it in, read the whole, I'm gonna again do the same thing I did before, just read the whole sucker in like that. You don't have to do this. You can pass an input stream into the JSON object uh, constructor. Create my object, get the list array, get the X, get the, get the name, create my real list for each of those items in the uh, array. Um, unfortunately, I can't use the JSON array directly as an iterable. So I have to look the items up each time by saying get JSON object. And that's going to return a JSON object for that slot. Add the data by getting the name and getting the int. Any questions on that before I run it? I'll run it now. And we'll see that the data, it wrote the data and it read the data out. Um, it's dumping this stuff out because I define this as a data class in Kotlin, which gives you an automatic equals and hash code and to string and uh, a couple other niceties to it. Um, but in this case, we're taking advantage of the to string, so it just dumps those out. And let's take a look at the data. Now we're getting much nicer. This is a lot closer to a DSL. It's not specialized. It's a more general use. This and XML are both general use formats. With XML, you can take it a little bit more specialized and kind of like a DSL by defining a schema. And then when you use that schema, the language elements that you can use inside the XML validly are inside that schema. But it's very verbose and gross. XML is just disgusting. Um, it's useful, I mean, I, but I don't think it's truly human readable and editable. editable. Um, that was the goal of it, was to give a interchange format that people can read. But unfortunately, it's just the average user looking at that, it's not going to mean a whole lot. You know, if you're a programmer or maybe an, a web designer, you might get something more out of it. But if you're just an average Joe and you start seeing all these angle brackets, you're going to be like, what the hell does this mean? Okay, questions so far? So that's pretty useful. I think it's starting to move toward a more useful format. Um, we still have some potential versioning issues, but because we're doing the key value pairs, kind of like we did in the properties, and in a nicer format than the properties, it survives those version changes a little bit more nicely if all you're doing is adding, very similar to with our, um, our properties file. 
Okay, questions on that? Okay, so we can take it a step further from this by starting to write DSLs. And that's something that gets a little bit trickier. You're going to need a lot more support for it. Um, preferably some kind of a tool to generate a bunch of code for you. I mean, we've seen Antler, we've seen Xtext, they generate a buttload of code for us to actually do the parsing, creating objects, things like that. But one of the things I wanted to do is go through what's going on behind the scenes there. Because it's actually kind of cool, the technology they use to do the work behind the scenes. And when you have a parser generator, there's two main approaches that it ends up taking. And the most common of those are LL parsing and LALR parsing. LL parsing is commonly known as recursive descent, or that's the most common way it's implemented. The basic idea with LL is you're going to start from the beginning of your text and read forward and make decisions as you're seeing your text on what's going on. We do that by using look ahead. So if I had something that said person x name, oops, something like that. I'm going to take a look at that and try to piece together based on when I see the word person, what do I think is happening? And my code is going to say, I'm creating a person. And then at that point, I'm going to say, well, what do I expect inside that person? Well, I expect an ID. So I'm going to try to read an ID next. I'm going to expect a curly brace. So I'm going to try to read that curly brace next. If I get anything other than those types of characters, I'm going to say, hey, that's an error. Something looks wrong. I'm going to expect a name, I'm going to expect a string, and then maybe I have some optional address blocks. So at that point I can say, if the next thing looks like the word address, okay, let me go ahead and read an address. And at that point reading an address says, I expect an address, I expect a curly brace, I expect whatever else is inside there. And then parse it through. So it's a very straightforward process. And once you move into sub-elements, you're basically doing a nested step, which might recurse. So if the sub-element inside him had a landlord, which was a person, I could then try to match a person inside there as well. And to implement this, it's pretty simple. I define a person function. I define an address function. And then inside here, I'm going to say match something match something, and maybe just call person for the landlord section. So it ends up just being a recursive uh, set of calls. And we're going to run through one of these. Um, LALR is table-driven bottom-up parsing. Uh, LL is top-down, which means you make your decisions as you're coming from the top. So as you're walking through. <clears throat> With an LALR parse, what you're going to do is start looking at tokens. And as you see groups of tokens that mean something, you group them together and match them and then pop them up. It's often done as a stack-driven approach. So what we'll do is we'll take person and push him on the stack, push X on the stack, push a curly on the stack, push name on the stack, push a string on the stack for the name. And at that point, he says, hey, you know what? I see two things here that make a subrule. So if I had a subrule called name, I'm seeing name and a string. Hey, that matches my subrule name. So I'm going to take that, pop it off, and replace it with a name. Then at this point, I see person x curly name, and then an address curly some stuff. Once it sees that, he pops that off, converts it into an address. I have a close curly up at the top there. I see person X, close curly name, address, blup. That whole thing becomes a person. And so it's basically going down until it can satisfy rules. Think of this almost like a rules engine. Keep walking, keep walking. I see something. Translate it into something else. That's the basic idea how this thing works. These can be a whole lot of fun to debug. But think about that recursive descent parser. It's just nested method calls. You can walk that sucker. 
and I've, I've had to debug on both sides of this, and this guy wins every single time. I mean, you can debug the other stuff. I mean, like if you write, if you write a yak parser, and you can look at it and try to debug it, it's not pretty, it's not fun, and I wrote some debugging tools to help with it, but oh my god, it's a nightmare. Yeah, those debugging tools, unfortunately, when I was at McCabe and Associates, I wrote some for uh, Yak, and they were really helpful. And I was going to write a book that talked about them, and I had approval from the company to do the book on it. Until I decided I was going to leave the company, and then I, on the way out, I said, okay, I need something in writing about that. They're like, no, you can't do that anymore. I should have gotten the damn thing in writing up front. Whenever you have something they agree to, get it in writing, because they can screw you later on. Anyway, um, yeah, that was a cool tool, too. Um, so debugging these is the biggest drawback on LALR-type parsing. <coughs> the biggest drawback on recursive descent. Taking a look at the code that I wrote here, what do you think is the, is the biggest potential error that you could have? Stack overflow, how so? Since if you have an infinite recursion. Infinite recursion. So if I had address, the first thing, trying to match address, boom, we can recurse off into to Never Never Land. That's why we need to, to do those conversions we did in our grammar to get rid of the left recursion. Antler takes care of that for you, and there's tricks around that. But doing it manually is a joy. As you could, as you saw with the expression parsing, right? Okay, um, but it's uh, fortunately it's one of those things that the the place you usually need to do it is expression parsing, and it's been done a billion times, so you can find support for it pretty easily. Um, it's just a hassle. LALR does not have that issue because you're going, you just dig down until you match something, convert that into something else. Um, you know, I'd never really thought about it today until, or thought about it until today that LALR is a lot like a rule matching engine the way it works, um, where you basically define, you know, if I see data that looks like this, create other data based on these three things here. Um, it's a little bit more limited because you're looking at it just in a smaller scope, um, but it's very similar to a rule engine in some ways. Okay, um, and LALR, by the way, Frank DeRemer and Tom Pinello Shoot, is it two N's or one N? Um, these are the guys who came up with that. I worked with them out in, in California. They, they run a company called Metaware. Um, and they hired me because I'm an LL guy. And in C++, LALR cannot handle C++ grammar by itself. You need to hack it. Because there's a couple ambiguities in LALR that are, are in uh, C++ between declarations and expressions that you need infinite look ahead to determine. And LALR can't handle that. Um, so that was kind of cool. I, 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 nice guys, I, especially Tom Pinello. I swear he's the most brilliant guy I've ever met in my life. Scary, scary brilliant. And this is coming from me, right? <laughs> I have to throw that out once in a while. Um, but uh, Tom, one of the funny things about him was that his brain worked faster than his mouth would work. And every once in a while, you could see him getting frustrated by it where he's thinking through something and he's thinking through it so fast that he wants to communicate it really fast, but trips on it and just his, it's almost like his head locks up because he's like trying to communicate something so fast. He's so excited about it, but can't get it out as fast as he wants to. Um, yeah, he's, he's a cool guy to work with. Um, okay. Um, so to create, I'm not going to do an LALR parser by hand, um, but, uh, LL parsers and LALR, a lot of times they're written as state machines behind the scenes. You can do state machine version of LL, but I prefer recursive descent because it's debuggable. So what we're going to do here is write a recursive descent parser. Yay. Question. So why would you use LALR? I would not. <laughs> the question was, why would you use LALR? Um, it's, it is a little more efficient than LL. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the left recursion issues. Um, that's the main reasons that people would choose it. Um, I tend to choose LL just for pure debugability. It's just so much easier to deal with. 
Um, and LALR came out first, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, Pinello and, and uh, Dreamer came up with the concepts for it, wrote a bunch of papers on it. Um, and then Yak and Lex are based on it. Um, LL has gone through many iterations. They think the first iterations were all table driven. And then they came up with, you know, you just, hey, you can just write code to do this. Um, and recursive descent is what Antler generates behind the scenes. So if you actually look at the Antler code, it's going to be a lot more complex than what you're going to see me write here because it's, it takes in a lot of error processing and error correction and recovery and things like that, um, which I'm not going to do. I'm just going to do the raw, we'll kind of assume it works and just put up a really crappy error message if it doesn't. Um, but um, I just wanted to kind of give you the general feel for what's going on behind the scenes because it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay, so questions so far? Let's hop over into here. And I don't think I need my tablet anymore. Let me put him over here for now. I'm glad that ended up working. So let's first of all take a look at the data that we want to actually use here. So if I created this as my DSL, where just for the heck of it, I'm having this random name and age out on the front because I've just been doing that in all the examples. But then we have a bunch of persons being defined here and persons can have uh, addresses and work, addresses inside of them as well. Okay, so fairly simple little DSL here. I'm gonna copy all that. Let's create a new class file here. Recursive descent two. And what I want to do, first of all, is write a grammar for what that looks like. So here was what my data looked like that I want to do. Let's just define a little grammar so we can kind of see what's going to go on here. So we're going to start off with a, I'm just going to call it stuff. And I'm going to have it be name followed by a string. And then age followed by an int and then zero or more people. Something like that. Let me just take advantage of my tab key here. Okay, so, so far so good. That's a simple rule. Now let's define what a person is. And he's going to be the word person followed by an ID, followed by an open curly brace. And then we're going to have name, string, and age, int. And then we're going to have some addresses, zero or more of them. At the end of that, close curly. So this is fairly similar to an antler grammar. I'm just trying to do it so I can keep in my head straight what I want my language to look like. Now let's look at our address here. And he's going to be the word address, followed by an ID, followed by a curly brace. And what did I have? Street, city, and state. Street is a string. Oops. And then a closed curly. I think that's all I had in there. So he's a fairly simple little grammar that I want to actually implement here. And the first thing I got to deal with is tokenization. I want to be able to convert from characters into words. That is a joy to write. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a half step here and use a scanner class that's built into Java. And the scanner class lets you say, let me find the next thing in my stream that matches a regular expression. And I'm going to take advantage of that to just grab everything separated by spaces. 
That's a little tricky when you get to strings because the first approach I did on this, I set it up so it just said break up based on spaces and it would break up in the middle of a string. So I needed a more complex regular expression to say, let me break up based on if it's delimited by strings. And hopefully I will get the expression right. If not, I'll just copy it. Um, so to do that, I want to start with creating a next token method. I'm going to say fun next token. And he's going to take a scanner. And was there anything else I need? Nope. And he's going to return a token object, which I'm going to define. Tolkien. <laughs> that was a great typo. <laughs> yeah, it was close. So I mean, it, it was close. But it was it was, it was, uh, it was on the right track. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so um, my token, I'm going to make him actually a data class, and I'm going to have two things in him. Is he what? Can we get killed? One more time. Cause, cause he's the token. Oh, oh, okay. He's the, the the token class. Gotcha. I just and I should have, I should have caught that reference really quickly because I was I was up a good chunk of the night last night playing Until Dawn, which I don't know if you guys have seen this game. It's on a PS4. It's you're playing a horror movie. You get to take over the, these different ki kids who are just doing stupid things, and you get to either do the stupid things or not do the stupid things, and it's pretty gory too. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's um, there's a lot of the tropes in there. So, but um, the, the 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 token kid does not get killed first. At least that at least that doesn't seem to have happened yet. So we'll have to see. Um, but neat neat game. If you want a really well done game with a, with a, with a horror element to it that's kind of cheesy, but at the same time, you know, really amusing. Okay, so anyway, and there's a lot of like people that you might know in it, like uh, Hayden Panti Pantier, whatever her name is, um, Remy Malik, the guy from uh, Mr. Robot, uh, one of the guys from Agents of Shield, and a couple other people. But great game. Anyway, um, and I got it free because it was one of those PS Plus things, and I'm diverging all over the place now. So anyway, our token class here, I'm going to have him. Yeah, all that from token. Yeah, thank you so much. Get me on a tangent, and I'll just go running with it. Um, so I'm going to have the token have a code. It's just going to be an integer, so I can easily compare it. I'm going to say it's going to be a string or an int ID or an int or a curly brace, things like that. And then the actual text of the token, which is going to be a string. And these are going to be vals, like that. So I'm going to ask the scanner to get what it thinks its next chunk is, and I'm going to figure out what I interpret that to be based on the text that's inside of that chunk. Uh, so, did I need to do that? Yeah, I'll try that. So I'm going to create a word, which is a string, and I'm going to create a little infinite loop here because it's just easier to break out of this thing than have the conditions all at the top on that. And I'm going to say word equals scanner dot next Wait a second, is this the right one? Oh, that's not the one that I wanted. Find within horizon, taking in a regular expression, which we'll define in a little bit, and give it zero horizon. So what this says is try to find that regular expression and go ahead and cross line boundaries. Don't limit yourself to any certain number of characters. So he's going to just keep gobbling until he can match something. Um, that regular expression You know, actually, I'm going to make these all be in the companion object. I'm not going to bother creating an actual object for them. And I'm going to have a val regex. There's a couple tricks you can do with regexes in Kotlin. One of the most useful ones is to use a raw string to define it, so you don't have to worry about escapes, and then convert it into a regular expression. And when you say to regex, it actually does all the extra escaping that you might need. So if I just wanted to say match all non-white space, I could just do that. And so this will find, well, actually, it's not. this is just going to match the actual non-white space chunks. Um, 
I want it to be a little bit more complex than that, and you know, I'm just going to copy it because I don't want to think right now. As you can see why I don't want to think right now. So this you could use for a regular expression to build it. Um, I just copied one from a article I saw online on how to use the scanner. And this one takes care of escaped things inside strings as well. Yeah, don't squint too hard. You'll go completely insane on this one. Regular expressions in Java are a nightmare. If you, if you do them in Kotlin and use that raw string with the two regex, you don't have to worry about these times when you have like four or five slashes in a row. Uh, I, always get, I, I always get dizzy when I deal with regular expressions in general because of you have to escape them twice most of the time. Um, once just to get the string there, and then the second time to get into the, 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 the pattern creation. It's like, yeah. gives me the willies. So anyway, so I'm going to create this. I have this regular expression here that's going to separate by spaces, keeping strings together. That's what the little or is doing inside there. <clears throat> so um, this is going to try to find that next word, and then we're going to do something with it. So I'm going to say, first of all, let me just print it out. Just so we can see if I screwed something up along the way here. And then what I'm going to say is if the word is either null, meaning that there's no more things to get there, or the word is not blank, because I want to throw away white space, then I'm going to say break. Get us out of there. Okay, and... I think that's all I want to do inside that loop. So the loop is basically just going to keep gobbling the white space for me. And if you had other things you wanted to throw away, you'd gobble them the same type of way. Okay. Now I want to convert whatever that text is into tokens. So I'm going to say return when, and let's have some things like word is null. I'm going to return a token but I need some codes for these tokens. So what I'm gonna do is take a look at all these places where I have literals and create codes for them. So let's kind of break this down into where we have things that are interesting. And let's say val name equals that's not what I wanted to do. So we have name as one of them. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the new. That's a good idea. <coughs> I am so brainwashed into using ints for these because all the code generators just generate uh, a, a bunch of constants for them, uh, and so I just even think about a new here. So these are going to be uh, token type. Yep. I do not blame you. Okay, so let's um, let me uncomment this. So you have name, age. Person, string, int. I got age already, address, street, city. Oh, I know why I'm going to hate using this as an enumeration, because I'm going to have to put the damn enum type in front of it every damn time. Damn it. Uh, and then open curly, close curly. But I'm going to go with this just so I can give you a hard time. Okay, so we, did I get all of them? Name, age, person, string, int, address, street, city, state, open curly, close curly. I think that's everything. And you know, I'm just going to do this. Boom, boom, boom. There, I got all those. I need one extra one. I'm going to say EOF for end of file, just to be able to give me something to hold on to the end of file token. And so in here, I'm going to say return. Let's actually tweak the token to 
instead of it being an int, it's going to be a token type. <laughs> wow! Wow! Okay. Holy crap. Let's, uh, there. That's a little better. I was just visualizing having all that every single time I use these now. So now if I come over here and go EOF, boom. That's not quite as bad. And I'll just return like that. So, yeah. <laughs> Always happy to have something cause a good laugh in the class. Um, okay, so now we're just going to take the other ones, which are the constants. So when word is an open curly, guess what I'm going to do over here? I'm going to change this to just say word, so I don't have to type that in over and over again. So if we're open curly, this is going to become a closed curly. And then we have person, name, age, address, uh, street, city, state, um, let's see, am I missing, am I missing any of the keywords? Nope, that's all the keywords. So now we get down to after city and state, we have to figure out, okay, how do we tell if it's an integer? How do we tell if it's a ID or a string? So I'm going to say if word first character is a quote, then it's a string. And I'm going to say word dot trim quote off of him. And then I'm going to say uh, uh, if it is, if I can convert it to an int. So I'm going to say to int or null. is not equal to null. So I'm going to try to convert it to an int. If it converts to an int, boom. Now there's smarter ways to do this. And normally what you do is you have a state machine defined that looks from each character to figure out where can I possibly go and then eventually you get to a, a terminal state which says it's this. So if you saw it, number, 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 boom, it's a number. If you say number, number in, an, in a letter, then it goes off somewhere else saying it's an ID or actually in that case invalid. Um, so that's for the int. Let's change him to be an int. Yeah, this is not meant as a good example of Alexa. It's just meant as a easy to understand version of, of Alexa. But it works. Uh, okay, and so I think the other one I had, so I had ID. Do I have a colon in my syntax? I have a colon in my belly, but I... No, I do not. Okay, so um, the only other one left here is IDs. So it's going to be my else token ID. Urgh. There we go. Didn't, oh, I didn't have ID in there, did I? I missed that one. Followed by the word. Just like that. So, fairly simple little uh, next token thing. Oh! <laughs> so this one's going to be Person, name, age. Oop. This is why parser generators are such a good thing. Something like that. Does that look okay now? I believe that's good. Okay. So what I'm going to do in here with my main is let's go ahead and have it just spit out all the next tokens so we can just see what's going on. So where was my main in here? I 
can never find things when I want to. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is create an instance of that scanner. And he's going to take a file reader inside of him who is going to go data.people. And we're going to use that sucker. And then inside there, I'm going to let's just do a while true. And we will say scanner. Oh, no, uh, was it next token? Scanner. And we will print out the token. I made him a data class, right? And then I'll say if token is dot um, code is token type EOF, then break. Now let's see if that does something reasonable for us. Okay, so we have name is a name token, Scott is a string, age is an, a is an age, 51 is an int, person is person. This is all looking pretty good. Okay. So it looks like our scanner is doing pretty decently so far. <coughs> now, in order to read this from our parser, we need a way to grab a token and be able to look at it but only grab that token when we need to. There's going to be times in our parser where we need to make a decision. We need to say, based on what I see next, where do I want to go? If the next, like the, um, inside the person, if the next token is address, I'm going to go to the address rule. Otherwise, I'm going to drop out of my person rule because I'm done. Or I'm going to expect the curly brace next. So what I want to do is create a little helper function here that's going to grab the next token, try to match it against something. If it matches, consume it, basically saying I'm, gonna, I'm okay to move on to the next step. I'm going to hold on to that token as a variable called LA1 for look ahead one. You're going to see that mentioned a lot whenever parsers are being done, or recursive descent parsers are used. Um, so the next token I'm looking at is the look ahead token. And he's going to be of type token. And I'm going to give him a little dummy value. I'll call it waiting. Oh, there's, there's a reason why I wanted an int. Let's go ahead and put them up here as well. Waiting. So I'm just creating a dummy token here that I can just take a look at so I can lazy instantiate the next one. Anytime I consume a token, I'm going to set LA1 to waiting. So the next time I ask to match a token, it's going to suck one in from the, the scanner. So in here, I'm going to create a method called match. Some people call it match, some call it consume. I'm going to use uh, two match functions. One that I can use to just say, does it match? And the other one that can say, consume it when it actually matches. I should probably just call the second one consume. <laughs> that would make more sense. Yeah, so I'm going to call this one match. So this one is going to take in the scanner. And what token that I actually want, what I'm trying to expect there, and say, did it match or not? And inside there, I'm going to say, if LA1 is waiting, then I need to suck another token out of the, the uh, um, scanner. So I'm going to say LA1 equals next token. Scanner. And then after that, I'm going to say return la1.code equals code. So it'll say true or false if the next token matches what I'm expecting at that point. Now I'm going to create a consume method, which is going to take in the scanner, take in the code, 
And I think I wanted to have him return the value as well, right? Yep. And he's going to return a token. So when somebody asks to consume something, I'm going to say, if it matches, then set LA1 to waiting and return the previous LA1. If it doesn't match, I'm going to throw an exception saying, that's it, all bets are off, you screwed up. Now, in the way I've written this, I don't have any good way of knowing where something happened because of the way I'm using that scanner. So the error message is going to be incredibly difficult to use. It's just going to say something went wrong, basically. You know, printing out the, I was expecting this, and this is what I got. Um, if I were really doing this, I'd write a, a much nicer scanner. I just didn't want that part to take forever because that can take forever to get that right. <coughs> okay, so consuming it, I am going to say if match scanner code. Then what I want to do is say grab the current token, set, the, set LA1 to waiting so that I'll consume another one next time I'm asked, and return token. Just like that. Now, if I wanted to write that Kotlin y, I would write it more like this return la1.apply la1 equals waiting. Now, did that make anybody dizzy? <laughs> what that does. And this is actually, there's a trick you can do in Kotlin where you can swap two numbers using an apply like this, where you basically say return, or you say A equals B dot apply, B equals A. And then that'll actually swap them. And it's like, bang, mind explode. Um, what this does is it says evaluate LA1, and that's going to be the value that's returned for this whole apply expression. And then execute this. That's really all it's doing. So I'm holding on, I'm basically holding on to LA1 in a temp variable without it being obvious. So that's something if you do a lot of Kotlin, you'll probably see code written like that. If you're worried that somebody might not understand it, write that. Basically does the same thing. Okay, so that is going to say if I match, I'm going to return that token. Otherwise, I want to throw, I don't know what to call this, an illegal argument exception. I would probably should create my own custom exception to say, you know, parsing screw up. Uh, and I'm going to say unexpected, ah, unexpected finger. And what did I want to say here? Dollar LA1, expected token type. Okay, so here you're going to win the internet by suggesting the enum there because now I actually get a name printed out as opposed to a number. So I'll give you a point for that one there. Uh, expected that. So that actually be much. That makes the message much easier than what I had before, which is expected a four. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I'm actually using the entire token there. So it's gonna it's just gonna do the two string value so you can see the code and the actual string. Um, you know. Yeah, but I figured this 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 gives you a little bit better of a chance, but it's still if you ever write something like this, you're being evil to your user. Okay. Make sure at very least you keep track of where tokens came from. Um, I don't know if the scanner I would think the scanner's gotta have something. Let's just Take a look here. Does it say? Is there a get line or something? Ah, I'm not seeing one. Wow. Oh, wait a second. What does it return? It returns a string. Wow, that's really awful. They should have had it return a. Uh, something that says the line or at very least set a variable inside to say you know the last token came from this position so don't use the scan that scanner for anything real okay so got that that's going to consume it now we get to write our parsing rules 
And these are the fun ones. And then we're going to change our code up here to do something a little different. So I'm going to have a rule, a parse, I'm going to have a function for each one of my rules here. So a stuff function, a person function, and an address function. And just so I can see what's going on with these, I'm going to move this down to here. And let's say fun stuff, taking in my scanner, it's fun stuff. And I'm also going to, there's a couple ways we can deal with the data that we're going to create here. I'm going to pass in a map that we can just stick the people into. So we'll say people, it's going to be a mutable map of string person two. Oh, we need people. We need objects. Class person, actually I'm going to call this person three because I already have a person two in a different file. And unfortunately I didn't put a package name on any of this, so. Bad Scott. Uh, let's make it a data class. He's going to have a val name, which is a string. A val age, which is an int. And a val addresses, which is a mutable map of string address three equals mutable map of like that. And let's create an address three. with a val street city and state kind of like that so now we got some data make that be a person three okay so we're gonna pass that in there what I'm gonna do to uh, match our stuff overall is we first of all are gonna look for name to see if that matches if it does, grab a string, use its value. So we're going to say consume token type name. Oh, I need a scanner in there. And then we're going to consume token type string. And then we're going to consume token type age. And then we're going to consume a token type int. And here we will say val name equals that. Val age equals that. Keep in mind that these are tokens coming back. So name and age are now token objects. I'm just going to shortcut this by saying dot text. And over here dot text dot to int. Like that. So that's where I'm just pulling those things out of there. The consume is going to make sure that that object actually exists and then move the pointer forward basically in the file to grab the next token. Then to create our persons, I'm going to say while true person and how did I want to deal with end of file? How did I do that before? Oh, look ahead, duh. <laughs> so this is one of those cases where I'm going to look at the next token without actually consuming it. So I'm going to say while match the next token is token type person then I'm going to actually try to match a person. Passing in the scanner, passing in people. And let's create that function. And let's take a look what person's got to do now. So he's going to have some of this type of stuff. And that is why caps lock sucks. 
So we're going to try to match the word person. Then we're going to grab an ID for the person. Then we're going to consume an open curly brace. At the end of this, we're going to consume a closed curly brace. Going to consume name, which is going to be a string. Should have just copied that from the previous one. And an age, which is an int. To int. And this one's going to be dot text. This one's going to be dot text. And he's going to be. Like, why doesn't it like that? Because I've duplicated it. There we go. So that, cons that consumes that data. And now we're going to do the same kind of thing with the address there. And we'll say while match scanner token type address. So we're going to look ahead. And fortunately, this little language that I wrote here only requires one token to look ahead. Some languages, you might have to look a couple tokens down the pipe to see what do I think the next thing is. But this little language was simple enough. There wasn't really much in the way of ambiguity. Um, and then we're going to say address, passing in the scanner, and passing in the person. So we can add the address to the person. Oh, I didn't create a person yet, did I? Let's do that. Val person equals person, passing in name, age, and then I can say people sub ID equals person. That should be a person three. Okay, and now let's create our address. And we're going to do something kind of similar there. There we go. Do I want to add the address? I'm not quite following you. I'm going to add it inside here. Yeah. As opposed to having the address function return. Of per, uh, I could have had the address return an address object and then added it there. That's another option. Sometimes I just get in a mode where I pass things down and then assemble underneath and then don't return up. It, I'd be consistent about it. I mean, either approach is perfectly fine. Um, so we have our ID, consume the open curly, street, city, sorry? Oh, I did want that as dot text, yes. That would help. So street, city, state, and then we're going to create an address, street, city, state, and then person.addresses sub ID equals address, something like that. Okay, so that, I think, hopefully, we'll do what we want to do. Let's come back up here now to our main, and instead of just doing our next token thing there, which is a decent check to see what's going on, was only for testing the scanner. Now I'm going to say, while true, go ahead and try to match a person. Um, or actually, uh, no, I don't need a while true anymore. So I'm just going to call stuff. So I'll just call stuff passing in the scanner. Like that. 
and the people, which I need to create. Mutable map of string person three. There we go. And then let's dump this stuff out at the end here. And I was, did I print out the name and the age? No, I didn't. Let's do that in here. Okay. Should we cross our fingers and see if this works? Or run it? Something has to be wrong. You're kidding me. Really? That worked? <laughs> I'm always surprised when it works the first time. Um, although I shouldn't be by now. And I've done this enough. Um, so this ended up reading in those those uh, tokens, running through the parser, and then creating objects for them. So this is an example of a recursive descent parser. The basic concept is pretty simple. And if you think about it, debugging this would really be a piece of cake because you're just walking through functions here. And it'd be way easier than trying to debug dependency injection. Okay, questions so far? So, a couple things to think about in here. What if I wanted to put these in any order? If I didn't want to require street, then city, then state. What do you think I'd have to do? I'd have to look ahead a token, see what it was, and then consume it. So I'm going to do my look ahead first, get them, then consume them. Would I need any other constructs? Well, as far as coding constructs, I'd need a loop around it, right? So I'd have to keep looping to see what the next one is. Let's just give that a try real quick. So if I came in here, I'm going to say while true when Oops. Match scanner. Um, <coughs> oh, token type. Street. Put him up there. When it's a city. And when it's a state, else, break. Really? I can't do that? I thought I could say break while. Ah, I can't remember how to do that. I'm going to revert to a thing I hate. I mean, it's not too bad done equals true. I made it a val. I always do that. Okay. I need to put these variables outside of there. Bar. Street. You know, actually, I'm going to do a... Uh, no, no, I'm going to have them be nulls. Does what? Does my address allow for null? Not down here, it doesn't. So, I mean, I have a choice now of either validating to make sure that all three have been specified or modify my address to allow a null. So what I want to do at this point, that was going to be my next thing, is we need to validate this, right? So we need to make sure that they specified all three and that they only did it once for each one. So if I wanted to say 
Uh, if I didn't care about them specifying only once and just said the last time wins, so if they said street three times, the, thir the last one wins, I could do that. But it'd be nicer to say, hey, they probably made a typo or a copio when they were doing that, just copying lines. So to do that, I'm going to need some kind of flag to say if these things were set already. Oh, yeah, duh. Don't need a flag. Thank you. Even better. So we'll say if street. Actually, I'll do it this way. That's what I have to do the let this way for that to work. Um, actually, I can do it this way. Yeah, that'll work. Not super pretty. Actually, I could have done with a let instead of an apply. It doesn't really matter either way. To use what? Um, you, could, you could do that if you wanted to. That's perfectly fine. One of the advantages to the um, to using the the let and the apply is that it gets a copy of whatever the val expression is. In this case, it doesn't really matter. But if street were a variable that could be changed in another thread, then this actually grabs a copy of it to work on it inside the block. Um, yeah, it would have been just as easy to to do it with uh, an if in this one. And that'd be city, and then state. Throw him in there. Something like that. Yep, because I want to say if it's non-null, come in there. Why was that legal to just say state.apply? Because if I did that, it's not giving me an error. And it should be. Because that guy's nullable. That's interesting. That should be, uh, that must be a bug in, in, cop in the, uh, the editor here. Because if I, if I try running this, I bet that that's going to fail. Let me just for the moment do that. I think the compiler is going to bark at me here. Huh, it actually ran. That's weird. Oh, 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 because, well, no, wait a second. Why isn't that giving me an, a, uh, an error? Because he's nullable. Oh, unless apply allows you to pass in a null. No? If it said T question mark, then it could be nullable coming in there. Huh. Um, yeah, because you can see here it comes back as a, oh, oh, by, uh, <laughs> by passing it, by passing it in this way, you get the null inside the block. Yeah, so that's valid. Okay, I got to wake up. Um, okay, so that should take care of that. And then down here, we just want to do a check to make sure that all three are specified. So, um, I could say if street is null or city is null, or state is null. 
grow new. Oh, not new. <laughs> Street, city, and state. Oxford comma. Must be specified. There we go. Now let's try this out. First of all, with the existing data. Huh? They're getting, They're getting smart cast. I love smart casts in that. Well, it, it does it based on data flow when it can figure it out. So in this case, it's saying if any of those were null, I throw an exception so I couldn't get down here. And then it, it as soon as it gets past that block, it knows to smart cast them to non-nulls. It, there's, it doesn't always work. There's a few data situations where it's just, if, it, if the flow is more complex, it just can't figure it out, even if it might be able to or, or should be able to. I would have expected if you said street does not equal null and city does not equal null, and then put that inside the block, I would have expected that to work. Right. Well, this does the same thing because of that throw. Right. The, yeah, throw, the throw interrupts the, the control flow. Yeah, give it a little bit more credit. Just a little bit more. That, that worries me from time to time. Um, okay, so we ran that. Let's change the data people just to move these around a little bit here and see what happens. Boom, that worked just fine again. It got the street, city, and the state. Let's see what happens if we duplicate something. And there we go, state more than once. And if I missed something... Must have city, street, and state. Yay! So you'll notice how implementing something like optional order is quite a pain in the butt. I mean, it really, it, it, the complexity of this, this parser increased significantly just for that little feature. Um, now, some parser generators will help you on that. I mean, look at this compared to what it used to be. Um, some parser generators will help you with that and make things a little bit more clean. Um, like in uh, in Xtext, they have the option where you can say that I have a given keyword. You know, it's any of these keywords, but um, they can only each appear at most once, and it handles all that behind the scenes for you, which is great for when you're having a language like Java where you have public static void. You know, it's like, yeah, you could say static public void. That's fine, but, you know, uh, the order doesn't matter. It's just that you have each one once. Um, you can see the code behind it gets a lot more complex very, very quickly. Um, and as our language gets more complex, if we had uh, a lot of conditionals, a lot of alternatives, um, you're going to have a lot more of those checking the match to see which way I should go and then executing the, uh, the internal or ex executing the alternative. Make some sense? So I really wanted to go through this just to kind of give you a little bit of a taste for what's going on behind the scenes and that it's actually a pretty direct translation in most spots. I mean, just looking at the grammar, I was able to translate this into the code fairly simply. And, you know, it just becomes kind of a recursive problem when you have nested alternatives. Then you just do the same kind of algorithm for each alternative. Um, the tricky part that the parser generators have to do, or that we had to do here, is take a look for what's known as the first set of, of each rule. Each rule has a potential set of tokens that you can uh, look at as look-aheads to say, do I go inside that token? So for any given role, the, any given rule, like let's say this, per, this stuff here, the first set is the first possible token when you go inside that rule. In this case, it's the name one. For person, it's person. For address, it's address. So it's not super interesting there. Um, but if you had an alternative, like if I had... Something like A is X, and then something, or Y, something. Then in that particular case, the first set is X and Y as possible tokens going in there. So that way, when you're looking for, if somebody references A, you, your logic would just say, let me look at what the first set is for A, and then test to see if it's one of those. If so, go into A. Okay. The Biggest advantage you get of using a parser generator versus doing this by hand? What do you think that biggest advantage might be? Besides a buttload of code generated. Is 
So that's that's a huge advantage there. When the grammar changes, when you change the grammar, it ge regenerates. You don't have to figure this out. If you change the grammar here, this is a pain, right? So that's probably the biggest advantage. Uh, <laughs> well, let's see. The biggest advantage, I think, is code, then updating each time. But then the next biggest advantage is making sure that the grammar is valid, checking for things that are ambiguous. Because if I just eyeball this, it'd be very easy for me to have an ambiguity and not realize it. With a parser generator, it can do the graph analysis on the rules to see, do I have things that are you know, infinite loops? Do I have things that are left recursive? Do I have things that are, um, I, you know, I can't make a decision between two branches because they both have uh, uh, the, the same first set. Um, so those are the big advantages you get in there. I just wanted to go through this exercise so that you got an idea of what's really happening behind the scenes. It's really not magic. It's something you could perfectly well do by hand. And it's not super hard to do by hand, but maintaining it, whoo, <laughs> you don't want to maintain this by hand. So be thankful for parser generators. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, is there anything else you wanted me to talk about? Well, in that case, then, I will say thank you so much for coming and being my first set of guinea pigs. Um, I'm very much, you know, if you guys have any type of feedback as far as, you know, ordering of things, topics covered, things you thought were worthwhile or worthless, things that you thought were missing, things that I should have gone into more detail on, any of that, please let me know. I mean, that helps me out a lot. Um, I'll probably be teaching this again in the spring, and so hopefully I can apply some of that to figure out, you know, what order should things happen in the spring. Um, and uh, I've also got to try to come up with uh, probably another couple hours worth of lecture. <laughs> it's, it gets hard going from, thankfully the first time was the summer because it's only 12. So I had to plan 12 lectures. I mean, the lectures are longer, but, you know, uh, once we get into a 14, I have to try to figure out what, how's the pacing going to work, where am I going to split things, and fun stuff like that. Or I could just create a, a midterm and a final. Yeah, I mean, it was. I, I think it was close to the first half of the class. I was pretty much hitting the hitting the end of the, the sessions, um, which is going to be tricky when I split it, go down to shorter sessions. So I'm going to have to split things up, and it might not be a supernatural break point. Um, at least for the for the next you know the next several sessions, I'm going to keep doing this face to face. So splitting it up when it feels okay, you know, when the time runs up, it's going to be fine. The tricky part is going to be when I go online. You know, if I convert this to online at some point, then having a good break point that break points that will work for both 12 weeks and 14 weeks. So, yes, so much fun to teach this stuff. Um, How long do they like? I mean, I assume the intention with most new classes is that they're going to take them online at some point. That's the idea. So The metric right now is do it in person at least once. Okay. Now, typically, the um, th the way that they do things is, first of all, the first time through, you have to do all your grade own grading. You can't bring in a grader. I wouldn't have been able to bring in a grader anyway with less than 10 people. Um, the next time through, you can get a grader. Um, I know, like, for the iOS class, I think he ran it once, and then they did online. He might have run it twice. I, I prefer to run it four or five times beforehand just to get a feel for pacing. And, you know, like, you know, obviously this, you know, stuff that was in this lecture here, I really would have loved to do a lot earlier in the class. And I think it would have made more sense earlier in the class. Um, the recursive descent parser, obviously, later. But the different data format type thing, I would have liked to have that a lot earlier just to kind of hit some details there. Um, and I was tempted to have you guys do an assignment on using JSON or something, but I'm like, eh. I don't really see a whole lot of benefit to doing a, a JSON assignment here because I want you to do stuff that you wouldn't have normally done. Um, um, and also, if there's other things that you would have liked to see in assignments than what we did, um, how did you guys feel about the, the layout manager stuff? Did that feel like a decent example to use? It's like, I, and, and did, it, did you get really, really sick of it after several assignments? Well, 
Mm-hmm. Right. That's true. I didn't think about that. It's like have, having you, it does have the advantage of once you run it, you see what the GUI looks like, and you can tell if you screwed something up. That's a really good point. Um, I wish I had intended that, because that would have been a great intention out of it. Um, otherwise, it's one that you have to just kind of like look at the data manually and try to figure out. And yeah, actually, that's a real big benefit to it. Um, the um, with the Android class, I had had. Uh, Originally, I had like three assignments that all did the contact manager, and people got really sick of doing contact managers. You know, the first one was basically doing it with activities, then redoing it with fragments, and then at the end, redoing it with data binding. And people were like, enough of the contact manager already. Um, so I wasn't sure if that same kind of effect came here, but it seemed like that worked out pretty well then to use the, the layout manager. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's really helpful to, to try to try to know where to go with that. Um, and it was nice because you could kind of build on it. The only thing I don't like about building on things is uh, I have to either get the grading done really fast or get you guys an example to start off the next one just in case it didn't work out well. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, I recommend, you know, send me feedback after you get your grades. That just makes everybody more comfortable and, you know, more, more free on what they're saying. Um, but, you know, I definitely appreciate any feedback I can get because, you know, First time through the class, it's like, you know, I like, overall, I like the way things went. There's, you know, a few things that I want to improve on a little bit here and there, especially that one with the uh, uh, serious. It's like, <laughs> that one went sideways fast. Um, okay. Any other questions or anything? Yes. Oh yeah, that would have been cool. Kind of actually, you know, add some add some real logic to the game, or real logic to the app, um, as opposed to just you know, oh wow, another button. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that could be cool. Um, I just got to see if I can figure out the timing of it. Um, I think I liked having we had six assignments. Is that right? I think I liked having six assignments. That doesn't give much room for more than two weeks. Although the first couple I had one week assignments, right? Yeah. So that might work. Yeah, I'll consider that. That could be that could be fun. And then of course half the class is gonna be like, Games are hard. Why are you making us write a game? I mean that was what I got in the Android class a lot. Was half the people loved that assignment, half of them hated it and they thought it was unfair. It's like it's just a program. You know, there's st sometimes people have a thing in their head that they think games are just inherently hard. It's like, it's just another kind of program. That's all. Although I might eventually just give them an algorithm, you know, for the, the jewel matching. You know, just say, here's what the algorithm looks like in pseudocode, because a few people had issues with that, just getting the algorithm down, and I don't really want that to bog them down too much. <laughs> tic tac is a little too easy. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you guys so much. I mean, I really appreciate it. You were a great group to have for the first time around. Um, I mean, it's it's nice to have people who can, you know, do all the work, keep up with everything, ask good questions, come up with good ideas and comments while we're doing the class. It made it a lot of fun for me, too. So, anybody graduating? Nope. Um, he was either graduating this term or next term. Almost there. You get that light at the end of the tunnel. I got two left. So close, but so far. <laughs> yeah, you'll get you'll get through it. You'll get through it. But pre congratulations to all of you. I'm sure I'm sure you guys are gonna have no problem getting through it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you like the class, go to rate my professors. Write me a little note. <laughs> I, w I always love seeing those. It's, it's nice to to. I come up on the, the main Hopkins page. I come up as the, they say top professors. I don't know why. I'm, I'm like a four or five average on there or something. There's others who have higher ratings, but they don't show up. I think it's a combination of like the number of comments and the ratings. So I don't know. But it's still kind of fun when I go to the page. It's like, hey, I'm up there. <laughs> they got rid of those. Yeah, they got rid of the hotness stuff. Because um, what they meant by those was really, is this a hot professor? Like someone who's, who's attractive. Yeah. And people somehow didn't get that. 
Yeah, it's like, you know, when I first saw it there, I, I was thinking, they can't mean that. <laughs> I was... Yeah. I mean, I was thinking that, I was thinking that it's got to be something about, I thought it was like a trending thing to say like how their ratings have gone over time. That like, you know, if you're, if you've got a, a you know, strong trend, then you're hot. But it's like, nope. And I, when I found out what it meant, I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, something like that. And I, you know, came into these classes and like, no, this was really kind of boring. I don't know what this other people saw in it or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, the instructor's hot? It's like, jeez, that's just ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I'm glad they got rid of it. It was, it was, it was really it's pretty demeaning. Such a childish and sexist thing. Yeah. And it, it, what's, what's really funny is, like, if you think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody would have given a second thought. And, you know, I'm glad people are giving it a lot of thought nowadays. Because it's just ridiculous when I see stuff like that. It's like when I'm watching old Star Treks. Some of those, holy crap. I mean, and like I watched Crocodile Dundee recently. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, there was, um, yeah. But anyway. Really watching any old TV show or movie, right? Almost anyone. Friends, there are a lot of like cringeworthy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 nuts what used to be considered acceptable, and the 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 thing that I feel bad about is like you know I didn't think twice about it back then, and you know looking back at it I'm like how did I not realize that, and you know I didn't participate in that myself, but it's you know it just it was something that I guess just was so normal in the culture that it's just ridiculous. I should turn this into a half philosophy class. That'd be <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be more fun. It's like I like it when tangents happen like this. Yeah, exactly. Philosophy of DSLs. <laughs> That's all just rename the class that way. <laughs> That'll work. Oh, but tell all your friends this is a good class, if you thought it was a good class. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping to, to get a good number of people showing up for the next session so that I can do it more regularly. Because, you know, with only, you know, we had uh, six this summer. Or it was five. Oh, five. We had only five this summer. Uh, you know, they were kind of like, well, we don't know if we're going to offer this every term. And it's like, I love offering this every term. It's more money. Well, yeah. <laughs> He had a lot of trouble getting people filling it up the first time. Um, it was a, um, there was a lot of people who said, why are you offering this? Really? Which really surprised me because it's like, you have the answer, why, why you not have the yeah. I mean, originally, like the program chair was really pushing against having both iOS and Android classes. And then they were, they, were too similar. they thought they were too similar. And they were actually trying to push through a restriction that you could only take one or the other. And uh, Josh and I convinced them, it's like, no, it's, there are very different ways of approaching things. And which, you know, I like even more. It's like, if they both did things exactly the same way, then I'd be like, yeah, let's not let credit for both. But they're both very different approaches to programming. And that's something that I, I really like when different classes show different ways of doing things. It gives you guys just so many more tools to use. There is, there is something, and I'm trying to remember what it was. It's there's it's something you can run in a VM, and it's some kind of simulator. But it's you, I think you have to purchase a copy of iOS to run it. Um, which that you know, it's something I really want to come up to speed because we've had a lot of people asking you know, does Tac Dogs run on iOS, and and that's going to be a, a much bigger issue over time. And I don't want to use any of the 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 cross platform toolkits out there because it just dumbs everything down. Um, there are some similarities between Swift and Kotlin, and there's actually a push for running Kotlin on iOS. I know there's some people working on that. I don't know what the state of it is right now. Um, that I would absolutely love because then you can share common code between them. But I still think that the front ends are going to be very very different, and the app design and everything like that is going to be very very different. Um, different ways of thinking of things. Um, but how many people here have taken the design patterns course? What did you think of it? Uh, I thought it was good. Uh, yeah. You were with Jan, right? Uh, I think Jan taught that. Maybe, uh, I don't exactly. 
but it was mostly discussion. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I taught it as a very heavy programming course when I taught it a while ago. Um, and when we went to switch it to online, it's like Jan and I had just such different ways of approaching the, the material that it would have been a, just a nightmare to try to have anything. You know, we would have had to just split things up, and then it would have just been this inconsistent between the you know styles between the different things. So I just bowed out. He he originally got the course. I think he re um, suggested it about ten minutes before I did, and uh, so he was the, officially the, the the prime instructor. And so I decided, okay, he's prime. I'll bow out. I miss teaching that class. I really enjoyed it. Um, but now I have this one in the Android class, and I've just got to come up with some kind of a good test for Java for the Android class, because uh, um, <laughs> some people have just they just don't get it. <laughs> it becomes fun. Okay. So, anything else? Any other questions, comments? Um, I will, I, you know, now that this is done and I've caught up on stuff at work, I'm going to hammer out those two last assignments, get you the grades. From what I've seen so far, none of you have anything to worry about. Um, I mean, it's, it, you know, you've all done a great job and there's 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 nothing I like more than grading something and only having to write well done. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes I'll see something, I'm like, hey, you could have done this in addition or you could have done this differently. But uh, you guys did some great code this term. And it looks like you really understood the concepts. I mean, especially, I did forget to put in the questions on the on the last two assignments. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Um, I, you know, normally I don't like reading essays, you know, it, but I really liked reading what you guys wrote because it really, you, you were th really thinking about the content and you were really coming up with a good analysis of, you know, differences between things. And it was, so, it was really nice to see some comments here and there saying, I went into this thinking this, but then at the end of it, I'm like, wow, that's actually a good way to do things. Um, which is, I always love hearing that because it's, it's something that, uh, you know, it, it shows that, you know, the assignment actually had some value. You know, actually trying it helped convince you that that was something worth doing. Yeah, I thought that way about the lazy essay. I really like, don't, I still don't love that in general, mm -hmm. but it definitely gives you a nice, like, hierarchical look at what the thing looks like in generated code versus, like, mm -hmm. my other generated thing, which is, you know, all these lines of... Blob. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that, you know, especially you know, that lazy instantiation one, it's like looking at, you know, thinking about the pattern to start with. And it's one of those ones when you first look at, you're kind of like, I don't know about that. But once you've used it a few times, it's like, there was a while, like, when I was doing GUIs, when I was actually writing all my GUIs that way. Um, now what I typically end up doing is using, like if it's in Java, I'll use the, the double curly blocks. So it's basically creating a an instance initializer. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but instead of a constructor, or instead of so, a constructor that calls the other constructors or whatever. Let me say the new Java class here. Really? So uh, if I wanted to create a frame, I could say new J frame. Something like that. And then inside there, I can say add new J panel. And then add new J button. I mean, this is, this is kind of like a little DSL. Notice I keep forgetting my semicolons. Yeah, this is about as close as you can get to an internal DSL in Java. Um, and it's really, the funny thing is a lot of people are like, wow, that's magic. I didn't know there was a double curly. It's like, it's an instance initializer. It's basically a constructor that you're defining without a name. And, uh, you know, then, you know, add action listener. Oh, what am I doing? That's better.
better. Something like that, and then do something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's dizzying. The disadvantage here is it's actually creating subclasses for all those. But if you're not, if you're, it's like, you know, one subclass for each GUI item, and yeah, or each layout, basically. It's not that big a deal. Um, So think of this as a constructor. It's kind of similar as if I said JPanel. It's, run for every sure. so it's like an init block in Kotlin. Yeah. Um, and you can actually, one of the things with these instance initializers, if I remember correctly, you can have multiple of them in a Java class in different spots, I think. I might be wrong on that. But it's basically just that. It's just uh, springing it out. So this is something that... Um, It's a constructor. Okay. So, it yeah, so if I. Um, it's it's just for uh, anonymous inner classes, so it's uh, because you can't have a named constructor in an anonymous inner class. If you want a constructor and basically initialization block, you can put it in there. But you can actually use it in a non anonymous in a non anonymous inner class as well. So something like this. That's really the place it was designed for. So if I said new a. They're all, so this J frame there's with the, the when I say new something and then an open curly, it creates a new anonymous center class. So there's a new J frame subclass, a new J panel subclass, and a new J button subclass here. If I didn't have the curly braces, I'd be just creating a new J frame. But anytime you say new something, open curly, then you're defining an anonymous center class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a little trick that, you know, this is something I've done more recently if I've done GUIs in Java is to use this type of syntax because it looks so much more like a DSL. Although now I got Kotlin. I don't need to do that anymore. Uh, let's just see what this does. Have you used Swing in Kotlin? Um, I think this class is the only one that I did it in so far. I haven't used Swing for real life in God knows how long. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, probably the last time I used Swing, there's a... Uh, a line reader application that I have for when I direct plays. So it's like I take an electronic version of the play and put it in this little app. I have a Java version that runs on the desktop and then an Android version. They both use the same data model code behind the scenes, but they just have different GUIs. And that's like the last time I used Swing. And you know, it, it's serviceable. I'm not going to call it good. Um, let's try running that. Hopefully I see 42 and 22. What did I do wrong? Oh, I have a Kotlin foo? <laughs> Foot. <laughs> oh, shoot. Where did the... Where did the... What? <laughs> what the what? IntelliJ, you suck. I could have just left it. Yes, so it actually will let you run multiple of those curly blocks. Um, although the thing that I'm not, I believe what's going to happen here is that this will start at as 10. So I think that the value of this will be 10 because I'm pretty sure these get run after 
the initializers are run. Let's just double check. Wow. It does them in order. And, and in the middle of those, that's really interesting. That surprises me because I thought they were executed in the same order as constructors. But no, they're actually run during the initialization. That's wow. Hey, I learned something today. I love that. It's a good day. Um, it's nice when I learn stuff. That's true, the parens, yeah. I learned two things today. Very good day. Um, it's very rare that I learn something new in Java like that. <laughs> You can't delete the brackets because you'd have executable code at that point. So it's like there you can't just have a statement dangling in the middle of the class. So that's really interesting. Now, of course, if I did this one now, I'd end up with 22. But that's, yeah, that, that really uh, surprises me. But yeah, you can have multiple of those. So that's, you know, this type of syntax here, it's a little on the gross side. And one thing you'll notice that I always do with my anonymous inner classes is I always put the curly curly paren semicolon on the same line so that it just it calls it out because it's just so damn ugly. It stops your eye. Um, true. I don't have these huge, crazy indent levels. Um, but the main reason I do it is this type of thing here so that you can really see where the anonymous inner class is ending. It just calls it out very strongly. Um, and, and, you know, I always advocate that. I, I like to advocate alternative uh, um, styling for, for things like this. And like when I showed you that enum that had the state machine in it, where I put things that look like a table. I mean, every once in a while, if you see something that the readability improves because of doing a non-standard thing, push for it. I mean, you know, readability in anonymous inner classes is gross to start with. Um, I just, I'm just trying to do something that helps call it out a little bit more. The ew factor, I call it. Okay. Um, yes, two things learned today. I like that. Okay, anything else? Any other questions or anything? Okay, well, congratulations, everybody. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't taken the Android class, if you can squeeze it in, it's, it's a good class, if I do say so myself. You learn a lot. It's a lot of work, though. Hey! Awesome. <laughs> Um, it is more work than this class. <laughs> I think, it, for those of you who've taken it, is that a safe statement? Yep. Yeah, by a good bit, I think. Um, we got like breaks in this class that were not really breaks in the class. Yeah, it, it, moves, it moves fast. You know. but, but you're not going to have any issue with it. I don't know that there was like a ton of work. It was just we got down weeks in this class. Okay, I'll have to make sure I don't give down weeks in this class anymore then. So how did the workload feel? Did it feel like a acceptable or fair workload for a class at this level? Do you wish there was more, wish there was less? You think it was about right? Okay. Ah, <laughs> as opposed to the Android one, which really, <laughs> it destroys lives, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I'm a little fancy on cutting back the workload in the Android class. I like having what I have in there because it helps do some meaningful things. You know, I could have had the examples just all be little trivialities, which some people would love. You know, I've had comments along those lines, but it's like, I want it to be something more realistic. I don't think every class in this program needs to be like, not that much work. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, especially now, it's like with, with Kotlin being the language I'm using now, and next term I'm going to do Kotlin for everything in there. Um, so it's like, you know, they better catch up. I mean, you got an advantage already because you've done Kotlin. So, you know, that's one less thing. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that I'm, I'm pushing, you know, a huge amount of Kotlin stuff. You know, it's, it's like, you know, just it's, it's so similar to Java. It really is. True. Yeah, and that's something like as I'm talking through it in the in the Android class, I'll be uh, you know talking about you know here's you know this more straightforward way you can do it that looks just like Java, 
you know, versus here's a cool thing you can do in Kotlin that, you know, makes your life a little easier once you're used to it. I got to say once you're used to it, because a lot of this, when I first started learning Kotlin, whew, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's like, especially like the, the lets and the applies and those, I'm like, what the hell is that doing? But then once you really get to see what's going on behind the scenes, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was more fun than the Android class because it wasn't like quite so much work. It's not as brutal. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's there's. Uh, I could see that it gives you more time to to breathe and think. And that's one of the things I really want with this class is it's be more of a think about how you code. And, you know, you know, one of the reasons why I hit a lot of design patterns in here is, you know, if you haven't taken design patterns, you may not have heard about them. And, you know, and it's also even if you have hearing them from a different angle sometimes helps and seeing how they do it in a different language sometimes. Um, but I, you know, whenever I can see something in an example that is very much like a design pattern, I love to call it out and, and be very explicit so that, more people understand the the terminology so that's the big benefit is having words the uh, um, design patterns are all about having a vocabulary so that when I communicate to you I can say just use a visitor and you will understand what that means without me having to explain it for 20 minutes well visitor would take about an hour and a half but you know <laughs> but if I said use an observer you'd be like oh yeah I get that that's not a big deal um, so fun stuff Okay, well, thank you again so much, and uh, best of luck on the rest of your, your program. I will be getting the grades out very shortly.